guys and welcome to another show of let's talk about ice and we're here to talk about ice we're going to be talking about the intricate journey uh, of a young man who went into ice addiction and quickly came back out but whose life was destroyed in that very short time frame um, so I'm going to introduce you in a minute to Cameron Cameron Hello. Hello. <laughs> that was one minute, sorry. That was my one minute. I'm going to do a little bit of um, housework. Is it housework? Housekeeping, sorry. I always get that wrong. It's housekeeping. Um, so it's Leanne's, um, Leanne tells me housekeeping and I think about housework. It's not good. Um, but just a couple of things to mention. Just want to do a huge thank you to a few people who have been supporting Australian Anti-Ice Campaign um, and helping us put the freeze on ice in our nation. So a huge thank you to Document Solutions who have already sponsored us for over 12 months with all our printing needs here on the Gold Coast. Thank you so much for your support. Document Solutions is a place to go if you need a copier or if you need anything printed out. Um, they're amazing, uh, amazing group of people there. Um, they've been supporting us so much um, with all our flyers and items that we hand out at schools and throughout communities. So we're really grateful for Document Solutions. Thank you to Mercer and Cooper again for sponsoring another 50 youth. Um, in high school um, and helping them be protected against the dangers of ice and having by having our workshop in there So thank you to Mercer and Cooper and anyone that purchased the property through them or put a portfolio together through them um, You've been you've directly contributed to helping educate these youth So thank you so much because every person matters and every youth matters and every day 27 youth a day become addicted to ice in our country so every time we go into a classroom and we do a workshop it's a win it's a huge win because it's many lives and many families that are not going through the devastation of ice addiction Thank you to the Chariots of Light for their continued support. Um, every month they support us financially, but also uh, as brothers um, and, and sisters in this journey, helping uh, support people in the community that are going through hardship because of this drug ice. ice and also, um, you know, just riding around together and having fun together and, and, and sp spreading the message of love. So thank you to the Chariots of Light for your generous and loving support and help. It, uh, with the Australian anti ice campaign. Um, Sarah May Wines, thank you so much, Mr. Terry Morris, again for our um, awesome officers here who continues to support us and the team behind him as well. So thank you so much for our officers. We love them. Um, and without the contribution of, of people in our community like that, we can't continue doing what we do. Um, so, you know, we are an unfunded charity uh, and we do encourage you all out there to jump on our website and join the AIC Army. Yeah, we are um, submitting for funding again. We need your signature on our petition um, to take that across to government. So please join the army today and help us put the freeze on ice in our nation. Without you, we can't do what we do. So uh, every $10 donated to AARC helps us educate one youth against the dangers of ice. So that's from year 7 to 12 that we go into. We also work in prisons. We also work in corporate. So if you're a business and you want um, you know, us to come in and do a workshop for your, for your company, um, please, you know, prevention's better than cure. And you don't want to regret that tomorrow and say, I should have done it. You know, um, so please contact us. And guys, I just wanted to remind you about the walk against ice. Like we're 23 sleeps out, um, 23 sleeps, yeah, out of the walk against ice across the nation. So if you haven't registered yet, you do need to register. Um, so if you haven't registered yet, please hop onto our website. And I'm going to give you that website address. Get a pen, write it down, and that's www.australianantiicecampaign.org.au. Click on Walk Against Ice banner at the top, and then you can go in to find where your walk is happening and register for your walk. Come and walk with us. And you know what? You can get a, your T-shirt. You can get that online when you register if you like, and one of our caps so that you don't get the sun in your eyes, and you can help stand against this drug that's destroying our nation we need your support we've got to do this in unity we're not going to wipe this drug out by force 
the community it's a community problem the community need to get involved we thank you to all the rotaries that are partnering up with us across australia and joining us in in the fight against ice we have the gold coast uh, uh the walks are happening on the gold coast in cairns in innisvale uh, penrith new south wales bensdale victoria um the mornington peninsula um in victoria frankston area and let me see if i can get this right in perth in Mandra? Yeah. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I go Mandura, it's Mandra. Um, so there are a lot of areas that you can register and come on the walk. Um, it's on a Sunday. It is at 10 a.m. in most areas. Um, some, I think up in Cairns it might be a little bit earlier. But hop onto our website. Have a look where your local walk is. Please join us. You know, it's half a day, a couple of hours of your time um, at, to help, help stand against this problem. Because without your contribution, it's just going to continue to... To, to be a bigger problem um, and it continues to rise as a, as a problem in our community so please join us in the fight against ice and join the ARC army today on their website so I look forward to seeing your name on there guys today's title is um, called if I could turn back time and like I said I have an amazing young man sitting next to me Karen who um, is now part of the Australian anti-ice campaign um, and he's undergoing some training to uh, be, to educate to go into back into schools and and into the community to help educate against the dangers of this drug um, and Cameron's also working within the office in business development he's a bright young man I've just grown to love him dearly and I know that he's going to be of a huge impact um, in our community, uh, in your community, and, and get him in front of your kids. So today we're going to share a little bit about his story, um, and I look forward to um, delving in a little deeper because we've had a long chats, but I really want people to hear, Cameron, um, how easy and how quickly, um, you know, it can really devastate a life of a you know, such a beautiful young man with an amazing opportunity. You know, you went to a good school, you have a great family, um, you've had, you know, an upbringing, um, you know, that most don't get the opportunity to have, you know, um, in, in schooling and parenting. What happened? Uh, look, I, um, <clears throat> I started using drugs at a young age mm -hmm. and... I think that was to make myself feel better about myself because I was never truly happy with the way that I was. Mm -hmm. So I started off smoking weed mm -hmm. and that led into doing things like acid and mushrooms and MDMA. Mm -hmm. um, that led into doing coke. Yep. And then I found myself constantly chasing a stronger high all of the time. And that led me to meth yeah. and um, like Andrea said before my addiction was very short-lived it was over a period of about five to six months but um, that was in ice that was in so ice that was just ice yes but tell me something when did you start how old were you when you first picked up was marijuana your first yes and you know, child? I, I think I smoked weed when I was 14 years old and so between 14 and what were, how old were you when you picked up an ice pipe? Uh, I think the first time that I tried ice was when I was about 22 mm -hmm. or 23. And I'm presuming it was through a pipe. It was, was it through smoking? a pipe. Yep. Yes, and it was through a pipe. Let me ask you something. Did you affiliate it with marijuana and like, did you think it was a really heavy, heavy drug or did you just like think it's, you know, something you smoke? Did you think about... I guess... I guess because I was smoking it, I didn't, I didn't fully realise or I didn't acknowledge that it was a hard drug yep. because I was smoking it. Yep. And, you, you know, you think, oh, I'm just smoking it. There's no harm really in, you know, having yep. a couple of puffs. Yeah. But, you know, that, that really just grabs a hold of you quite quickly. Yeah. And, um... So you'd say, um, you know, trying marijuana and then moving into different drugs, um, would you consider that like gateway to opening the gate to maybe going to the next one and trying the next one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would. Um, so generally, in my own experience, 
when you're getting weed, the person that you get weed off often has mm -hmm. other substances um, that they're obviously keen for you to try because mm -hmm. they want you to buy them. Yes, so, right. um, yeah, I would consider it a gateway drug. I mean, maybe not for all people, but for me it has been, yeah. yeah. Um, I hear that often, Karen, that, you know, people start somewhere there and, and then they go, generally, they, they work their way through other drugs um, and end up at ice and then ice just destroys them, you know. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and that's why we're making such a hard stand against ice, you know. Um, every drug has a negative impact on your body. Um, and, and, and I'm saying that generally um, because some medicated drugs that the, you know, the doctor might give you might do you some good for a certain uh, you know, ailment um, or something that's wrong within and re to rebalance something in your body um, or to fix something that's wrong in your body. So generally I'm talking, uh, you know, street drugs, um, you know, they're going to have a negative impact long term on your body. Um, so, you, you know, it's about the choices that we make and, you know, you can make a, a, a choice to put, you know, say vital greens in your body and that's going to have a positive impact um, and you can make a choice to, you know, uh, do, do some ice or, or have take some recreational pills um, um, and so some youth things that they're doing and which has a long lasting um, you know effect negative effect on the body so we encourage our message is not even once because it's not worth it specifically with ice but you know we we like to talk to the youth about the impact of all drugs you know because every drug has an impact you know side effects you know usually if the prescription drugs it's in the box you know it's the side effects and um you know this is what happens i'll mm. give you an example right the doctors wanted to put me on because i see a cardiologist regularly they wanted to put me on heart medication and i said well what uh, are the side effects well the side effects were this long you know and i'm like um i don't think so i, I had a choice right then to take it or not to take it um, because of all the side effects but the problem with ice it doesn't come with a label on the pipe no it doesn't it doesn't say you know what's in it and what it's about to do to you and that's what we're here to expose you know so I want to go back to I mean generally as a youth a young man uh, 13 14 you're going through those um, you know, emotions of, um, you know, do I fit in, am I good enough, um, you know, and, you know, a, a lot of youth around that age, you know, tend to have, um, you know, issues that they should talk about instead of trying to run from it, yeah? Mm -hmm. Did you consider, like, talking or walking through some of the issues that what you were facing before? you decided to go down the journey of drugs? No, and I think that m might have something to do with immaturity. Um, I think that when you're that age, you don't, you, you can't fully comprehend problems for what they are, yeah. you know? And this sort of issue of kids who have low self-esteem or they're not happy with who they are, I think that's got a bit of a stigma around it and I think that you don't want to openly admit to somebody that you're unhappy with yourself yep. you know you want to put on a facade that you're you know you're doing fine and yep. you know you you want people to like you so you can form especially as a young kid yep. and oftentimes to conform mm. you do drugs yeah yeah. And unfortunately, that's the way it is these days. And it's it's got this thing about being cool or, you know, you, you see cigarettes on movies and stuff like that or drug use in movies. And yes. young kids associate it with fitting in. Yes. So yeah. I, think, I think initially that was a way for me to to fit in or to be the cool guy mm -hmm. or, you know. Yeah. And... And talking to somebody about that never even crossed my mind. Yeah. And, you know, and then once you start, you get into this sort of... Lifestyle? <laughs> Lifestyle, or yeah. I was going to say roundabout, where you just keep going around yeah. and around and around, and you can see mm -hmm. the exit, mm -hmm. and you know that you should take it, mm -hmm. but you just keep the blinker on, and you just keep going around and around. 
that's a really good way of putting it, um, Cameron, because, yeah, yeah, I've never heard it put like that before. Um, because that is true, you know, there is a window in the cycle of addiction and that's called contemplation. You could contemplate and change. I could, I really sh don't want to be here, I really shouldn't be going down this path, it's not serving me any good. But, you know, you go around again in that cycle of addiction and until um, that contemplation stage, it, that cycle becomes harder and harder. Um, and every time you reach that contemplation stage, stage um, you know there's an opportunity for you to step out and at that time if you know if you're a parent watching or a family member that has somebody in addiction um, I, I'm specifically talking to you right now at that contemplation stage if we can have the tools ready to have that conversation and swing in somebody that's been in the place of your loved one that's in addiction to help them see a better way out and to create a pathway out, that's where our buddy system works, okay? Uh, we can help families with some tools uh, to be able to understand that cycle of addiction and, and that stage and how to have that conversation, what to do, what not what not to do because there is a not to do section um, and to help create that pathway and that opening um, and that doorway for your loved one to help, you know, step out of that space. And unfortunate, very unfortunate, you have to wait for that cycle for them to come to that space again and that is very relevant that you know you can see it but your blinker stays on and you go around again and then it gets harder and harder uh, until they you know there's no more options until they've you know they have you know a, 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 a point in time that I can't do this anymore I need out I've got to stop get me off this roundabout I want to get off you know so and that that is when we can help the person um, step out so that's a really good point to, to bring. Tell me, do you have brothers and sisters? Did you, what kind of school did you go to? Like, because people think that, you know, drug use is really attached to the low, social low economic, you know, community. And, you know, if your parents are on drugs and they're fighting and they're, you know, you don't go to a good school or whatever, that's, that's where the drugs are. So tell me a little bit about your background. Okay, so I, um... I went to a prestigious private boys' school in Brisbane. Yeah. Um, I have two older sisters. They went to a Catholic girls' school. Um, Mum and Dad have never had any issues whatsoever with substance abuse. Yeah. Um, I had a very good upbringing. Yeah. Um, Extremely educated. Educated, yes. You, you are. I am. Um, yeah beautifully educated congrats to your parents <laughs> yeah no look I, I couldn't pick a fault with the way that I was raised yep. I was raised with love and understanding and acceptance and you know I um I really had it very good yeah so I can't attribute any of my drug use to my upbringing whatsoever yep. and it just goes to show that it's can happen to anyone, hey? Yeah, indiscriminate. It can absolutely happen to anyone. And my education didn't help me. My family couldn't help me. Um, it's just a, it's just a very powerful and destructive drug ice, yeah. and it just absolutely takes control of everything. It certainly does, Cameron, um, and we'll we'll get there in a little bit. What it did do to you, and and it, nobody deserves that journey. Nobody. No, they don't. Um, but let's go back. I want to hear a little bit about your environment. So, were your friends using drugs? Did they go down the ice world with you? What? Um, no, okay. no. So, they weren't. so when I was younger, a lot of my friends did smoke weed, mm -hmm. and as I was growing up in my late teens and early twenties, a lot of my friends would do pills, MDMA, coke acid stuff like that mm -hmm. but I was the only one of my friends who didn't have an off switch mm -hmm. so we would go out on the weekend and you know get on it or whatever and at the end of the night all the boys would say you know look I've had enough mm -hmm. I'm gonna have a couple of drinks and I'm gonna go to bed mm -hmm. where my mind my addict mind yep. would say I need more yep. I want more and more and more and more and more and it just it would never end for me once I started I couldn't stop yep. and I 
guess I gained a really high tolerance because yeah. when other people would take the same amount that I was taking, I'd say, I'm not really feeling what you're feeling, so I'm going to have some more. Yes. And look, during my addiction, none, none of the people I hung around were my friends. Yeah. You know, yep. they were just people that I used drugs with. And that is that is a fact. You know, we think at the time um, that they're your mates and stuff. And I, I heard a horrific story today of a young lady who we will get on the couch. And she will eventually, but she was um, saying, you know, her friends sold her off. You know, they sold her off. You know, she was raped and um, continuously and sold off from group to group. And she was in this hell hole, you know. And she said, I realised... My friends weren't my friends. Um, your friends, if you're using and you think they're your friends, they're not really. They're just they're just using with you. And the minute it, we have a commercial that we want to um, produce, and one of the commercials is you know they're in a car and they're all using together until you know one of the girls ODs and they throw her outside the car door at the hospital and drive off like. You know, that's what happens in addiction. The only thing that matters is the drug, is the next hit. You know, that they're not your friends. And if you're contemplating change, I, I kid you not, um, reach out to us because you don't want to be that person that, you know, has been sold off to different groups or, uh, you know, hurt like that. You know, you, you don't deserve it, you know. Your friends, those people are not your friends. No, they're not. And it's... It's funny, you know, when when you're using, no one will want to give you drugs. But as soon as you stop and you <laughs> tell them that you've stopped, <laughs> yeah. they'll go, here, have some of this, yeah. have some of this. Because they want to pull you back down yeah. to their level. They want to bring you back down to where they are so they can feel better about themselves. And, you know, you, you get out of that world and you watch how quickly everybody disappears. They don't want to know you anymore because... You don't have anything to offer them. You're not bringing drugs around. Yeah. You're not taking them to get drugs. You're not, you know. And you're kidding yourself if you think these people genuinely care about you. Yeah. Because if they genuinely cared about you, they wouldn't be giving you drugs. They yeah. wouldn't be using drugs with you. Your real friends are the ones that are trying to help you get out of addiction. Yeah. They're your real friends. Yeah, that's so. true. And it's tough to say that um, because people go, while you're in it, you go, oh, no, nah, no, nah, my mates are all right. Oh, you know, yeah, he's my mate, me. yeah, you know. Until it's too late. That's the thing, you know. So when you um, then move, did you know that marijuana, by the way, did you know that marijuana is being laced with ice and um, MDMA's uh, pills, ecstasy tablets are being cut with ice as well? I didn't know yeah. that pills were cut with ice, yeah. yeah. And, and they're lacing marijuana with ice. Um, we've had that proven various times so it's really sad to hear that um you know because we we do work in youth justice as well um and some of the kids are going oh but i'm just you know just doing um just smoking a bit of dope and so what, what, you, did you know this because you got to be careful what you're actually putting in because ice is a synthetic drug and it eats away the internal you know of your body of your vascular system of your muscles it, it breaks down your neurological pathways in your brain and affects your memory and your heart so you've just got to be really careful what you're putting in uh, and but you don't know these things you know out there and um, people will hand you uh, anything as long as they're making a quid and getting their fix you know so and it's handed out to girls for free really and like you said you know they'll give you the drugs to get you back in mm. and that that is so true but they won't give it to you while you're on it hey? no so tell me what happened so you in this ice world. Um, so your friends weren't didn't go there. So no. do we introduce you to this? Like not the name. We don't want to hear any. But you know, how did you get? Was it older people? Was it you know, work or? You know? Look, I um. I really started to develop a problem with amphetamines when I was about. Twenty five, mm. um, twenty eight now, and. It started off with using dexamphetamine, which is an ADD medication. Yeah. And um, I was concreting at the time, working six days a week, and it's quite a um, <clears throat> it's quite a hard job. Yes. Working very <laughs> yes, hard all the is. time, and um, 
I basically got to the stage where I was like, oh, you know, this is so tiring, I can't do this anymore, and I approached a friend who had some Dexies, Dexamphetamine, and he wasn't taking them because they just didn't work for him anymore, so he had excess all of the time, yep. and so I started taking five a day. What do they do? I don't know what Dexies do. But... So Dexies are just pharmaceutical speed, basically. Okay. okay. So... So do they get you, um, you know, keep you awake? And yeah, absolutely, they do. Raises yeah. your blood pressure. Raises your anything. blood pressure. It's very, it's very, it's basically identical to speed. Okay. Um, it's obviously not as strong as ice because it's not methylated, but it's still, when taken in high amounts, yep. a strong amphetamine. Okay. And um, like you said, you can't sleep, you can't eat. You stay awake for long enough, you become paranoid. Yep. It's got all the similar sort of side effects Actually. as um, meth does. Mm -hmm. And so I went from taking five a day to taking five at once, wow. to taking ten at once, and to dropping 20 at once. What? Yeah, just to, just to feel the high and to give myself the energy to work all day. That then led me to looking for something stronger. So that increase, your body obviously um, became immune to five, or it got used to that yeah. intake, and then uh, then you upped it and it got used to that. And that's generally, um, you know, people start off, they might have, you know, just a, a small hit, and then they, by, the, by the, the end of the week they're smoking, you know, $500 a week, you know. Because yeah. uh, your body gets used to it, and it, you know, tries to rebalance itself, it doesn't start to, you know, you don't feel the effect, but you certainly feel the effect of the come down. So you then, you know, hit, get a bit more and, you know. Yeah, That's exactly right. right. So when I first started using meth, I'd, when I say I first started, when I was in addiction yeah. last year, okay. um, I, when I first started, I would snort one point mm -hmm. and that would last me, I'd be up for two days, yeah. easy. Mm -hmm. And then so one point once a week turned into two points twice a week and that turned into three points three times a week wow. and um, it just grew and grew from there until I was doing three sometimes three or four grams a day wow yeah and that was in that six months that was in six months wow guys yeah. are you hearing this like you know Today, I, you know, is much more potent than what it was 15 years ago. Um, we're seeing ice, um, and they call it purity, but it's not any purer, trust me. It, it's basically more compressed, like uh, concentrated, um, up to 80 and 90 percent purity um, concentration level. And so it straight away starts to have that impact and um, break down the neurological pathways and it affect your serotonin and your dopamine supply and it starts to eat away at your at your body and then you know um in a very short time span people spiral out of control yeah and um, into psychosis and uh mental health and do you know like i didn't know this before but people can get into psychosis from trying ice just once and some people don't come out ever um, and I know a young man that um, has been affected like that. He was normal before. Um, you know, he could hold, you know, a job and conversation and uh, he got into ice addiction and he's never come out. Well, he's come out of ice addiction, but he's never come out of psychosis. He's mentally retarded from that. You know, and I had no idea that that could happen even just once. Yeah. You know, that is, it can happen to anybody. So you just need to be aware of that, hey? So you then within that time frame, what happened with your family and your friends and tell me what was going on around for you and, you know, was it your um, MDMA dealer or speed dealer that, you, you know, got, said, here, try this instead? So in 2017, I overdosed on heroin. The first time I tried heroin, I overdosed on it. Wow. And that led me into rehab for the first time. Yeah. Uh, stayed in rehab for about three months, and then I stayed clean for a year. Um, at the time, I had a girlfriend, and she left me in, I think, September of 2017. Mm -hmm. 
and um, you know I dealt with it the best way that I could, and you know I didn't didn't turn to drugs. I stayed strong and sober for about another well October, November, December, maybe January, and um, you know one day I was driving to work and I. I think an Ed Sheeran song came on the radio actually and it just, you know, I sort of started having a bit of a pity party and I um, I went onto Craigslist and I um, found somebody who was selling ice and um, I'd gotten to work at about five o'clock because I thought we were pouring that day but we were prepping so I sent this guy a message and I said, you know, how you going, are you awake? And he said, yeah. I said, where do you live? And he said, Lutwich. And I was in Lutwich. Mm. So I punched in his address and it was 600 metres down the road. So yeah. on a whim, yeah. feeling down in the dumps, so yeah. I just threw away all that clean time and went straight into it. Um, and, you know, if you go looking for trouble, you're going to find it. That's right. You will absolutely find it. Yeah. And if you dance with the devil, you're going to get burnt. Amen. And so true to that. That's exactly what happened to me. And it led from, you know, like I said, snorting it, and then I started smoking it again. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I became my dealer's best friend yeah. because I was getting small amounts, you know, three or four times a week. I wasn't getting half grams or grams or half balls or balls. I was getting two or three points. Yeah. And I was always doing that because I was saying, that's all I'm going to do this time. Yeah. That's all I'm going to do. I don't need any more. I don't want any more because this is all I'm going to do. Yeah. And then it would just be the next day and I'd get some more. Yeah. So one yeah. weekend, my dealer invited me around. He said, come around, you know. I was, he thought I was his best mate at that mm -hmm. stage because I was going to see him every day. Anyway, so I went around one night and um, there was this girl there. And... I, I knew she was troubled as soon as I looked at her, but, you know, off I went, in I went, sorry, and um, she said, have you ever injected it before? And I said, no, no, look, I, I always, I hate to say I look down on people who injected drugs, you know, I thought they yeah. were junkies, yeah. and I thought that... And you weren't. And I wasn't. Yeah. I just snorted it and, and smoked that, it. I that's wasn't. That's the wrong impression. That is the wrong impression, because I, at that stage I was becoming a junkie myself. Yeah. 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 And Whether you're smoking it, injecting it, drinking it, snorting it... It doesn't uh, make a difference. You're still in, ingesting the same chemical, it still does the same thing to your body, you're still addicted because you were using all the time, you know, uh, and needed That's right. It. Yeah. And then anyway, she said, you know, do you want to have a shot? And I said, not really, but she sort of really pushed it on me and away we went and I ended up leaving there with needles. Yeah. And then just from there, it just went downhill very, very quickly, very quickly. Karen, what were you thinking and where were your family? Uh, could people see around you, the people that loved you, could they see what was going on or did you hide it? How did... I became a very good liar yeah. and I think that's one thing that parents should really try and get in tune with yeah. is that meth turns you into a great actor and a great liar a and, and a manipulator. I was very manipulative, I became great at lying, I could look my parents in the eyes when I was high and you know I'd speak to them like I'm speaking to you now, I wouldn't have a erratic voice or... I wouldn't be fidgeting or anything like that. I'd keep straight because I knew yeah. what I was trying to hide. Yeah. And I think for a long time I did get away with it. But at the end of the day, you're going to know when your child is different. Yeah. And I became different. Yeah. And my parents noticed that. Yeah. And they would constantly be asking me, Cameron, what's wrong? You know, we know something's going on. Let us help you. Cameron, what was the different? Because we've got parents watching tonight. And... Some of them call us and they go, I'm suspecting that, you know, my son might be using, or my daughter might be using ice. Um, how do I know? Like, what was different about you? So, you know, we're trying to explain for parents what to look out for. Um, so, like I was saying before, I was a concreter. So, I was living with my parents at the time. I'd get up for work at about 4 or 5.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. I'd go to work and I'd come home at about 11.30 at night. So, that's a big indicator. If you're staying out very late at night and getting up very early in the morning mm. there's no way that you can physically sustain that sort of routine mm. without 
some sort of drug in your system. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing is I would basically go to my room straight away when I got home. I'd mm -hmm. hide in my room a lot because yeah. I didn't want my parents to see that I was cooked. Yeah. Um, or high, sorry. And um, appetite, I wouldn't eat, I wouldn't drink mm -hmm. for days. Mm -hmm. And if you're watching your kid eat on meth, it's going to be like they're eating cardboard and they're going to be eating very, very slowly. Yeah. I couldn't stomach food. Mm -hmm. And when I did play happy families with mum and dad and go up for dinner, yeah. it would be so hard for me to eat. I am usually usually huff my food down yeah. very quickly. And I'd sit there and I'd really sort of take my time. Mm -hmm. Another thing is, you know, I'd go from being very withdrawn to being very over the top and mm -hmm. very animated and overexcited and yep. you know you go from one extreme to the other I'd go from that to yep. going I don't want to talk to you I want to stay in my room yeah yeah were you angry did you have like anger and violent outbursts or did you were you man did you manage to you know refrain from that so that they wouldn't see I I would I would refrain from that so they couldn't see and I think a lot of my anger came out on the road mm -hmm. um, when I was driving. Yep. I found that that was a good way for me to mm -hmm. to vent because when you're trying to bottle it up all the time yep. when you're around your loved ones, you're trying to hide everything yep. Yep. and you're trying to, you know, you're trying to put on a, a show to show them what they want to see and mm -hmm. you, so you bottle everything up yep. and then I was actually quite fortunate that I never... I never had any violent outbursts with any of my family or friends or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say I didn't have violent outbursts with other people yes. that were in that world, yep. but um, it never affected my life at home, fortunately. Yep. And I wanted to bring that up particularly because, um, you know, I, I was the same. You know, I was able to um, hide that well um, and be aware not to allow people to see, you know, too much. Um, so. You know, you, you as a family out there, you might go, oh, but they're not that violent, they're not that angry. Look out for everything. It's a combination of things. Absolutely. You know, um, hot, you know, they're sweating a lot. They're in, you know, it's freezing and they're wearing singlets and, um, you know, they're not eating, they're not sleeping. Um, Bad breath as well. Yeah, good, yeah. good. What else would you say, you know, was a dead giveaway? Um, you were out a lot. You were, um, you know, hiding away in your room. A dead giveaway, I think. If your child's using intravenously, yeah. they'll try and wear long sleeves. I used to wear yeah. long sleeves yeah. all the time around my parents so they That's couldn't good. see the tracks on my arms. Yep. Yep. Um, it might be a bit obviously awkward or confronting to ask your child to see their arms. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if I got put on the spot and my parents asked to see my arms, I'd yeah. go, no way. And what would, what would a parent be looking for? Like... If they're shooting up, like some people don't have no idea what it Okay, so you'd be like, looking like, for like basically any lumps on the veins. Yep. Um, if your child is quite vascular and their veins are gone, that's a good indicator that they've been abusing their veins. Yep. I used to have veins all through my arms. Yep. Now they're all gone. Yep. They're coming back slowly and they do rebuild they do rebuild but they're not gonna, ever going to be what they were no, um and not. they're just just tiny little pinpricks yep and that's if they're good at it and if they're not they'll be big yep. and eventually you see on people they get these scars from going in the same spot all the time this is invaluable information for families out there yeah because you know the the, the biggest worry on parents um, minds today with the youth is um, this ice problem you know, how do you know that your your youth, your loved one, your it, it can happen to anyone. By the way, I'm not. I'm, I'm. We're targeting talking about youth right now, but I was 40, and there's so many people in you know in the older age bracket mm. that get introduced to it. But you know, youth haven't they haven't even got you know their 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 brains aren't fully formed. Their you know their body's not fully formed. So we're here predominantly targeting the youth and protecting them um, and, and the community along the way. But 
you know, so parents don't know what to look out for. How how do they um, gauge, you know, if their kid's all right? Because it's not like you come out and say, you know, the kids come out and say, yeah, I'm using, you know. Yeah. Um, so, and it can take a little bit of time to, you know, to just keep your eyes open and be aware to all the symptoms um, and, and side effects that uh, you're, you know your loved one might be experiencing um so that you know you don't go to sleep on the fact that that could be potentially a, a problem and there's always in the chemist there's you know drug testing kits we sell them on our website as well um worst comes to worst test you know the ones on our website i think that you can uh, it's a surface test so you can um you know test the surface of their school bag their phone um and you know if the, without having to confront them about it, you know, um, and, and just see if there's any traces. And, and if there is, you know, addressing your kid, uh, I know you're using drugs and, you know, and giving them a hiding is not the answer. Um, you know, get some tools to learn how to um, communicate and how to work with them um, to get them into help, hey? Um, and, and somebody like Cameron and myself and other our other presenters um, to have a conversation with them and, and help them create a pathway out because... You know, some of the stories that um, some of the presenters, have, you know, people coming in have told me, um, and I think, oh my goodness, we've got to get these kids to hear this, you know, and hear that and hear your story. And, um, you know, because that we need to warn them so that they don't get destroyed. So, so then you started using um, needles and mm -hmm. um, what happened that, made a change why why did you make a change you know because you know that only a very small percentage of people come out of ice addiction like that um not unscarred like you said those vascular uh, va um, veins still have to rebuild and as well as your body needs to clean itself out and your brain needs to reform new neurological pathways and your dopamine has to come back and, absolutely you know you, you're still doing some recovery um in in, in the program and you got to work on, you know, it's hard, it's hard work, but it's worth it. It's worth getting your life back, um, you know, and a life that you love and a life that you deserve um, and not being trapped in that hellhole, you know, that that is just going to destroy you and, and you're going to end up dead in jail or in a mental health hospital for life, you know, and that's really where you're going. And it's really sad to see some people are still out there, you know, um, hurting themselves so much um, when there is when there are people here waiting to help you yeah what happened so I started getting um, myself involved with things that I shouldn't have been doing and that culminated in That culminated in me getting in trouble with the police mm -hmm. and that just happened to coincide with the point where I'd spent every single cent that I'd saved, wow. every single cent, max credit cards with redrew on loans, um, just everything I had, every single cent that I had, I'd blown. Yeah. And, um, you know, I... Um, I actually formed a relationship with this woman who gave me my first shot mm -hmm. and the next morning after, you know, all this stuff had gone down, she said, you got to go. And I said, what? And she said, yeah, you got to go. And because I no longer had anything for her, mm. I was no good to her. Wow. So off I went onto the street mm -hmm. and I stayed in a construction site for three or four nights and just slept in there. And um, I just thought, you know, what am I going to do? I didn't have any money for food. I didn't have any money for transport or anything like that. And um, I, I had a mate that was calling me every day for about three months. My best mate. And, um, you know, I used to look at his phone call every day and I would just think, I can't. I can't pick it up because I know that he's going to tell me that I need help, and I. I didn't want. I didn't want help. I didn't want. To face reality, 
and when you get stuck in that that roundabout, you don't want to face reality because it's just so overwhelming. You've got yourself down into this deep dark hole that it's just it's just so overwhelming. And um, you know, I gave him a call. Were I, you ashamed? Maybe to pick up the phone. Absolutely, yeah. I was ashamed. Absolutely. And, and that's a big entrapment. You know, people go, I don't want to speak to my family. I don't want to talk, you know, tell people what I'm going through. I, you know, I feel ashamed. I don't want to look at what I've become. Yeah. You know, and that is, you know, such a, a, a stigma or that's such an issue um, with people in, 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 you know, in addiction that, um, please, don't be ashamed. Okay, you've fallen in a hole. You, you got entrapped in there. Reach out. You might feel ashamed to initially face your family, but reach out to us. Yeah, we're here to help you. So that is such a... Um, because people are scared, you know, to be condemned, to be judged. Um, you don't even want to look at what you've become. No. You know? And I got to the stage where I didn't even look at myself in the mirror. Yeah. I just would yeah. not look at myself in the yeah. mirror because I just... I just turned into a shadow of my film for myself and you know like so when I, I called my mate and I said mate I need help and he said I know you do mate where are you and I told him where I was and he was there within half an hour he came and picked me up and yeah. he took me in and I got clean at his house over a period of about three weeks and you know if it wasn't for him I would still be on the street and you know I'd probably be dead yeah I would probably be dead because there's at the stage where I would have done anything to get more gear yeah. and um, you, you really need to reach out yeah. and and get help when you're in a situation like that because you can't do it on your own yeah. and that's what I learned the hard way you can't do it on your own and there's organizations like this that can really help you get out of the gutter and get yourself well again yeah thank God for your friend yes thank God for your friend and this is what we say to our families don't give up, okay? It doesn't matter whether your loved one's been in that cycle and, and on the street. I mean, I'm, I'm sure your parents wouldn't have seen or, or like to have seen you out living on the street and, and no. homeless without food and stuff. Um, but a lot of families do, you know? And, and But don't give up hope because whether it's six months, ten years, okay, there's always that cycle of addiction and, and a space where we can help where that where that can come out, you know, and 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 you did. So thank God for your friend. And, yeah. and So then he walked you into rehab, or you decided that so you had to do the underlying work. So initially, um, I thought I thought that I didn't need to go to rehab, yeah. which is kind of ridiculous considering that I was using. A high amount of ice every day intravenously yeah. and you know that would go on for weeks the longest I stayed up for was 23 or 24 days Wow! and the whole time I was awake I didn't eat anything all I had was coke and zupa dupas and I was working six days a week oh, that's crazy. at the same time My goodness. it was and, and it was absolute insanity that's what it was it was just and you're not like it, there's no fat on you so uh, I can imagine you what were you weighing? Uh, I think the on? lightest I got to was 59 or 60 oh kilos, and I weigh 80 kilos now. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So that's almost, oh, half your weight. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And um, so then, because, see, a lot of people think, oh, yeah, I'll be right. Um, you know, I've been clean for six months or whatever. But they haven't actually um, done the work. No. And, and you know, I, I was... I was still, I still had that, that addict mindset that, you know, I don't, I don't never want to do it again. Like, I can't imagine my life without ever having another shot again. Yeah. Like, no way. Like, you know, I don't want to get help because then I'm never going to be able to have a shot again. Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, it took me maybe six months to get into rehab. Yeah. And that same friend was up in me, giving me a boot up the arse. You got to get yourself into rehab. You got to get yourself into rehab. You got to get yourself into rehab. And I was like, you know, like I've already gotten clean. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. But I hadn't lost that addict mindset that was telling myself, now that you're clean, next time you have a shot, it's going to be so strong. It's going to be awesome, you know. And I just, 
I just really struggled with letting that mindset go. Yeah. And even when I first got into rehab, I was reluctant. Mm. But now that I've been in there and I'm working on my issues, because you lose the physical addiction to the drug very quickly. Yes. Ice is not a very physically addictive drug. Yeah. It's psychologically addictive. Yes. You yes. get addicted to the the way that it makes you feel. Yeah. You know, and, and because it hijacks your frontal lobe of your brain, where logic, rational decisions take place, um, and it affects the chemical balance. You know, your dopamine supply. So, dopamine makes you feel like you're happy. Um, so, when that stops being produced in the absence of happy, there's depression. So, because there's such a chemical imbalance, and and the reconstruction of that takes twelve to eighteen months. Um, you know, to fully recover, um, that's that's the catch. You see, that's why it's different to most other drugs, um, and that's what hijacks and keeps you in there. You know, and and it takes longer to recover. Yeah, and people think that because they're clean, that they're okay. Mm. Well, you've got to do the underlying work, and you have to wait for this to start working again so you can go in there. You really have yeah. to look at the reason why you are using yeah. the drugs or why you're using the ice, and for me, it got to the stage where it didn't make me feel good anymore. Mm. It made me feel nothing. Yep. And that's what I wanted to feel because I didn't, when I took it, I didn't feel happy. I didn't feel sad. I didn't feel mad. I didn't feel glad. I just felt nothing. Mm. I felt nothing for myself, for my friends, for my family, for Joe Blogs on the street. Yep. You know? Yep. You see stuff happen and you sort of go, Oh, yeah. You know that's yeah. that's really bad, but I don't care. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it it gets to that stage where you don't you don't feel happy and high anymore. You just feel, mm. Mm. yeah, numb. 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 That's that's exactly the best way to describe it. You feel numb. And that's not living. No. You know that that's you no. May that's as it's well not living. It's not put living. Put a gun to your head yeah. because it's, yep. it's 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 numbing yourself and. And stopping your brain from being present, you know, and and you're just self-destroying your life, and you, know, you lost everything. You're on the street. You you you're not eating. You you know your your body's eating itself away, and mm. that's not a life worth living. You know, it really isn't. And so, you know, that's really sad that people can't see this before they say, "Oh yeah, I'll have I'll give that a try." You know, I'll, I'll give that that drug a shot. Because you're worth more than that, yeah. Cool. So you went into rehab. You made that decision to yep. uh, go and do. Some, because the first time you went into re, you went into rehab was a very short time. That was a short yeah. time, yes. And then, so now you've undergone the full treat. You're doing the full treatment. I'm. Do, I'm. I'm currently still in rehab. Yep. Um, I've been there for twenty four weeks. Awesome. Just shy of six months. I'm looking to stay for around ten months. Yeah. And my advice to anybody that does go into rehab, it's going to be the best thing for you. Absolutely the best thing for you. It's going to work on the underlying issues behind why you use mm -hmm. and really give your tool, give you tools about dealing with urges and, you know negative thinking about yourself and you know it gives you all these tools that you can use mm. to be able to beat your addiction and then to go and live life and not have to de depend on a drug to give you happiness yeah. and um, you know I highly recommend it to people yeah. it's changed my life and it is still changing my life but I'd say don't put a time limit on it yeah. don't Say that you're going to go for three months or six months. Yeah. You've really got to stay for as long as it takes. As long as it takes. For, That's exactly you know, right. like until you lose the urge, until you stop obsessing, and still you stop dreaming about it. Yeah. You've got to stay. Yeah, and and until you learn, you you'll know when you're ready. 
you know, to step outside of that. Um, and, and, you know, people look at it like, oh, no, I don't need rehab, I can do it on my own, I'm strong enough. And really we see 80%, if not higher, 85% of people relapsing. Um, you know, we put a, a tripod system of support around people when they come out of rehab after 12 months to help, um, you know, because you still are going to um, be in recovery, okay? You're going to be in recovery. For the rest of your rest life, of your you're life, going to be yeah. in recovery. But you need the tools to be able to combat that because otherwise, you know, you're going to fall again. You're going to go back in there. And we see it so many times. Some people fall in back in there and they end up they end up dead because, you know, the second time round and the third time round is always harder and harder to get out of. Um, I have personally, um, you know, I've known you for a few weeks now. You've been coming in and um, I've seen the change on a week to week basis in your eyes you know and it's I, I can see the program is working and, and you know you're still going through the process but it's absolutely phenomenal to see life coming back into your eyes just in the you know from the first time I met you to now you know this feeling coming back into your eyes and that's um, the the proof in the pudding you know that I wish I had the opportunity to do a program you know, I thought rehab was like a prison, and I thought that um, I was scared about it, to be locked up, you know, I couldn't use my phone, I couldn't come out, all of this stuff. Um, and like a year and a, a year out into, you know, recovery, and uh, or abstaining from using more so, um, I did start doing some external counselling and work on myself, but it was hard, you know, and I, I many times contemplated suicide because I couldn't, you know, it wasn't easy. I didn't have the tools there in front of me. You're in a space in rehab where, you know, they're helping you. They've been there. The people have been there. And they're giving you the tools to be able to work through it. I didn't have that privilege, you know. So if I had a chance, I'd do, you know, to, if I had to do it again, <laughs> which I never will, but, you know, that would be my preferred option. So we always encourage people to please, you know, um, consider that because it's an easier road. And in the big picture of things, it's what? 10 months, 12 months, whatever it is. It's a drop in the ocean. Out of your whole life. Out of your whole life, it's a drop in the ocean. And what I'd say to people that are reluctant to go to a rehab, it's not what you think it's like. It's it's fantastic there. They You have, you have staff that are trained to help you yeah. get over your addiction. And yeah. they are more than willing to sit and listen with you about any problems that you have. They're there to support you. They're there to guide you. Yeah. You get fed. You get a bed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. At the rehab I'm at, you do get your phone. Yeah. Yep. You, you and you're do, out. You're not yeah. locked up in yeah. the prison. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not locked up. <laughs> you know, we it. get to go out on the yep. weekend. Yep. You know, you we get to visit our families. Week. I get yep. to come down here and volunteer. I get to give back to the community. And yep. it's it's got a stigma about rehab that you get locked up in a building and you can't leave. Yes. And, you know, I just advise people that are looking to go to a rehab just to do a little bit of research about them f first and find one that's good for you yep. because this one has been fantastic for me I've got a lot of freedom to do what I want yep. and I've tried to take as much advantage of the program as I could yep. and you know it's what you make of it that's at the right. end of the day and uh, you know I wouldn't say that I love being there but it's very easy being there. Yeah. You don't have to worry about anything on the outside. Yes. You don't have to worry about rent. You don't yeah. have to worry about food. Yeah. You don't have to, you know, worry about your job. Yeah. You can just focus on getting better and working on yourself. Yeah. yeah. And what an opportunity to be able to work through that, um, you know, with people that know what they're doing and have been there a lot of the times and they're trained for that. So, you know, I, I went to visit a, a rehab up in um, Coffs Harbour and, you know, they're building a new section for guys and they're like, oh, well, we've got a, um, you know, a pool and a, and a gym and a steam room and I'm like, oh, I want to come to rehab. Yeah. <laughs> like, why? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so it's not what we think um, initially. So if you are contemplating change, um, and you're in, entrapped in addiction and you're thinking I've got to change my life and you know I want I want to smile again you know I want a life worth living it's there for the taking you know it's, you're really just a phone call away um, you know and we can we can help we can 
buddy you up with somebody um, like Cameron had his friend you may not have anybody at the moment but you know we're here to, to, to walk with you yeah so the number to call if you um, wanting to um, to reach out is one eight hundred no to ice um, so the number will be up on the screen um, or you can contact us um, private message on Facebook or our email um, here through our website um, but please reach out and, and if you're a family member that has a loved one in addiction you know we'd like to arm you up with some tools and some resources to be able to help your loved one um, and to connect at the right time we don't always connect initially straight away depending where your loved one is in that cycle of addiction but we eventually do and so we'd like to prepare you and give you all the resources to be able to help your loved one um, step out and and to get a lot their life back yeah so I look forward to um, you know to see to walking with you in in, in the future months and um, I know that you're going to be an incredible impact on the community as you already are um, but in the schools and with youth I think that you have a lot to share um, from your journey and and what I, how I destroyed and took everything from you and those kids are going to hear you you know so guys um, you know if, if you have kids you have school school age kids grandkids um, you want to encourage their school teachers to you know really connect with us and and get one of our presenters out to their school and, and protect them against the dangers of this drug hey um, lived experience is the best form of protection that they can get um, and and you know today not tomorrow because tomorrow they could be offered ice you know and kids as young as eight are taking up this drug and it's absolutely destroying communities so I encourage you to please get in touch with your school, send them a web, web page um, and tell them I want this in my school because I want to protect our kids, yeah. Cameron, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing so openly. Um, any last minute messages to parents at home or to you know people that might be watching that are in addiction, is there any final messages that you feel like you want to leave them with? I think I'll just reiterate something that you said. Just don't give up on your kids. Because as much as they might try and fight it, they do want your help. And I really did want help when I was in my addiction, but I was too ashamed of my behaviour to be willing to accept it. So just don't give up on your kids. Do everything you can to try and get through to them. I'd suggest taking a less confrontational approach. Um, try and do it through love. And, you know, my parents did all of this stuff, yeah. but I was still a hopeless case. But they never gave up on me. Yeah. Yeah. They never gave up on me. And, you know, I've repaired the relationship that I have with them now. And I'll, I'll hold on to that forever because I lost it at one stage. Yeah. And it's something that I never want to let go again. So, you know, I think just, just never give up on your kids. Just remember who they were before they started using ICE because yeah. ICE takes everything from you. It takes your money, it takes your home, it takes relationships, and it takes your soul at the end of the day. It takes who you are. Yeah. So just don't give up on your kids and, you know, hopefully, you know, you can get through to them and you will at the end of the day if you do it through love and, yeah. and through true. kindness, yeah. So true, love conquers all. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome message. Thank you for sharing your heart and um, being brave enough um, you know, to come and talk about this so openly. Um, if we have any questions, guys, please pop them up uh, because we will be online answering them for, uh, you know, um, for after the show here. And I just urge you share this uh, video, um, you know, share this clip on your Facebook because you don't know who's out there that is ashamed to um, to talk to anybody, but they might see this message um, and listen to it and he really hear it um, and they might reach out for help so you could potentially um, you know save a life so please share this on your Facebook it's only a click away it's not going to cost you anything please share it so that we can get the message out there can I teach you or if you don't already know our little slogan our message is not even once by the way okay goes like this not even once not even once guys god bless have a great weekend we'll see you next week stay safe stay clean <laughs> 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 thank you is that all right yeah.